This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 138, recorded on June 17th, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Today, I happen to be in San Francisco, California. And I don't have my usual co-hosts with me, but I am meeting with a professor of microbiology and immunology here at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center, an old friend of mine, Raul Andino. Welcome back. Hi, Binzen. Back because you were on TWIV a long time ago. Yeah, thanks for inviting me again. Do you remember that one? Of course I do. Philadelphia General Meeting of ASM. And uh, we, were, we were on video, we were live. Now you're back. So I happened to be out here for study section. And you're on study section too. So I thought I'd grab you and talk about viruses. That's what we do on TWIV. We talk about viruses. And people love it because these are conversations that people usually don't get to hear. So what I thought I would do with you is first find out where you came from. The only thing I know is you're from Argentina. Yeah, I was born in Buenos Aires in Argentina, and um, I grew up part in, uh, in Buenos Aires, part in the west part of the, the country, and then we went back um, when I have time to, to go to school. I did my PhD in the University of Buenos Aires. Um, that time I worked with uh, FMDV. Food and mouth disease virus. Food and mouth disease Which is a virus. problem in Argentina still, right? Yes, it is. Although I think they are uh, getting a handle of the, of the problem, but you know, food and mouth, uh, this is, uh, food and mouth virus is very um, dynamic, uh, you know, uh, virus, and it can actually uh, appear and disappear. So it's not clear that it's uh, completely gone. And this is an important agricultural virus because it, it kills cows or it makes them unsuitable for being sold for meat, right? Yeah, exactly right, exactly right. And also there were some political issues that, uh, you know, countries like Argentina was exporting meat uh, to Europe, but Europe and the United States didn't want to import sometimes cows from, from places where this sure. uh, disease was happening. So there was a lot of, um, you know, clearly uh, important uh, agricultural right. problem for Argentina. So a lot of Scientists work on foot and mouth in Argentina because it's such a problem. Yeah, there was, there was, it's like anything else, right? So there was some uh, initiative from the government mm -hmm. and good scientists yeah. jump into that. In fact, in Argentina, um, we started um, with my good friend and your former uh, postdoc, Gerardo Kaplan, to work in uh, FNDB to clone the virus. And this is back in 1983, 84, um, because there was some money and some interest to do that. But we actually started the first experiment uh, in molecular biology, or molecular mm -hmm. virology at that time together working in FNDB. So you were both PhD students at yes. the same place, same lab even? No, actually it was a collaboration between the agriculture department and where the, or the institute where Gerardo was working and I was in the university. Okay. So it was a collaboration between the two labs. So Gerardo came to my lab in New York to do a postdoc somewhere in the 80s, I don't remember, maybe 84, 85. Yeah. He had a very productive time. And then not too long afterwards, you came to the U.S., but you went to David Baltimore's lab, right? Yes. And you did a postdoc. Yeah, I went in 86 to David Baltimore's lab in MIT and Whitehead Institute, and I started working in poliovirus there, uh, poliovirus replication. And I've been working in that uh, since, although yeah. uh, over time we've been incorporating new aspects uh, of poliobiology or other viruses. Now really are we are thinking in a more global way, so we use viruses really that uh, could interrogate certain aspect of the host pathogen interaction problem. So sometimes we work with, with um, mammalian viruses. Sometimes, as you know, we work with insect viruses right. uh, because it provide an interesting model system to, to uh, understand this uh, host pathogen interaction. Right. So out of your postdoc, you came here to UCSF. 
Yeah, we spent um, uh, two years in New York uh, in in Rockefeller oh, University. That's right. When David moved to Rockefeller, when David yeah. moved to uh, Rockefeller, um, beautiful time. And I finished then my postdoc there, and then '92 I moved to the to the West Coast. Uh, first to the Glaston Institute of Virology Immunology. I was there for a year and a half, and then I finally found my home in the Microbiology and Immunology Department here at UCSF. So the Gladstone is downtown. Gladstone is just across the street. Across the we can street. see it. We can see it from this office. So we're on the Mission Bay campus, right? This is a new campus yeah, of UCSF, okay. and a lot of the basic uh, departments move here: um, uh, biochemistry, biophysics, uh, some some of the comp uh, more structural biology right. labs. Um, our in, um, department, the microbiology immunology department, is split in half. Mm -hmm. um, half of the PIs are here, uh, and half in the in the old campus because the old campus still the, the very robust immunology program that operates there. Yeah, there's more um, organ biology, infectious diseases, immunology operating over uh, the old campus. It must be hard to have a split department. It is complicated. Uh, it, it's actually interesting. Um, initially, I was very scared, and I didn't know whether to stay there or come here. And it turns out that coming here create new interactions where it makes us uh, start working in systems mm -hmm. that we didn't suspect would yeah. work. For example, in Drosophila. There was a direct ah. consequence of coming here. Really? And, yeah, and getting closer yeah. to people like a Pat O'Farrell, that is, uh, you know, an right. old um, uh, Drosophila uh, geneticist that, that, you know, helped us a lot. Okay. And, you know, we lost some of the interaction the, with the immunologists uh, right. that are behind. But I think they are, you know, like anything else, positive aspects and negative aspects of, of this kind yeah, of yeah. changes. You, you know? evolve, yeah. just like the viruses you exactly. study. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So if you hadn't come here, you probably wouldn't have become interested in Drosophila. And then all this work, which we're going to talk about, insect viruses, you wouldn't have done. That's right. right. And I think there is an interesting, um, you know, sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, idea behind this is that the important thing is that whatever life takes you, you yeah. know, and all the <laughs> serendipity, uh, serendipity and, you know, events that occur, uh, uh, you need to try to make the best out of them. And so what essentially we did is we, we found ourselves in the middle of of a bunch of biochemists and sure. uh, you know genesis and then what 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 do we do and um, we found out we're friends uh, sure you have friends. to you have to adapt, adapt basically you know if you're in a situation and you don't particularly like it try and adapt and yeah. take advantage of it yeah that's right taking advantage yeah of well that's good in science it's good but having smart people around is always great so yeah this has been great that you are able to go into an entirely new field yeah uh, it's been been a lot of fun and and, and you know in, in general we try to to um, work with people that we really respect and like you mm -hmm. know it's it's good to be in a, in a working on something with, in, a, in a relationship and professional relationship that you really enjoy it. right you know it's very motivating to me yeah so we're on Mission Bay campus I'm looking out the window here at mountains which is what you see in California <laughs> and there's a highway going past. What's yeah. the, which one is this that? This highway is uh, 280. It goes okay. to, uh, from uh, San Jose to downtown San Francisco. Okay. This is a highway is I take Is that how you take day. to go home? Yeah, yeah, every day I take this one uh, and then I drive to, to uh, Palo Alto. And the mountains over there, those are the mountains that separate um, the um, coast, the, the ocean. Mm -hmm. They are run uh, along the line of the ocean and the rest of the, the, uh, and the bay. So there's these mountains there. And it's very interesting because the first time I came to San Francisco, people asked me, where are you going to live in which uh, neighborhood? And I said, well, how shall I pick my neighborhood? And they would say, well, do you want sunny or not? And mm -hmm. I said, but you cannot pick up a neighborhood because of sunny over the <laughs> weather. It turns out that the fog that comes from the open ocean is stopped by these mountains. mountains. That's and right. So this, we are in the sunny part of the city. Whereas the other side is much more cloudy and cold. It could be 10, 20 degrees difference. Interesting. Yeah, the mountains make a big difference to the climate. They close in the city, really, and keep the fog. And it happens down in L.A., too. They're sur surrounded by mountains yeah, as well. Exactly well right. California has a unique geography that we don't have on the East Coast, mm. and also a unique culture as well. Right? Yes, 
Yes, yeah, very different, I think. Yeah. All right, so what, I have two papers I picked I thought it would be cool to talk about because on Twitter we never really have talked about viruses that infect insects. So let's, let's talk about these for a while. The first one was published in Nature. It's called Antiviral Immunity in Drosophila Requires Systemic RNA Interference Spread. So a couple of new things in this title. Drosophila, of course, is a fly, right? Correct. But it's, it's a fruit fly. Fruit fly, and it's the, it's the C. elegans of insects, right? Right, right. It's a, it's a model system for studying genetics. Yeah, Drosophila has been incredibly uh, interesting uh, from the genetic point of view because, uh, you know, we have collections of mutants. You know, we every time now that um, we need to interrogate a particular gene, we go to a collection and, uh, and of, of mutants. We request it by, by, by mail and they come here, you know, a few days later. Hmm. So it's a really easy. It's not that you need to, you know, gear up to make your knockout. Uh, right, but it's good. So every gene has been knocked out. Yeah, it's it's actually random insertion by with using these retrotransposons that, uh, and then they map where the transposons are, I these see. P elements. Um, so we know uh, more or less that it's around the, re and the whole genome is being sequenced. Mm -hmm. And so essentially you request uh, a P element that is around this gene or in this gene, but you have, then you need to confirm that really is disrupting the, the, the activity. So in this paper, you use mainly, well, you use both flies and cells derived from Drosophila. Yeah. And you infect them with viruses. So in the wild, insects have viruses like everything else, right? Yes, yes. And do, they, do these viruses kill them or they coexist peacefully with them? It's very interesting. You know, like just like uh, human viruses, uh, and uh, uh, you you do have viruses that coexist with uh, the insects. Mm -hmm. For example, Drosophila C virus uh, is a benign virus. You know, there's mm -hmm. many many flies that are persistent infected with the virus, but the fly doesn't seem to be affected. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, it is no kill. So we know this by looking in the wild that the flies are infected. Yes. So if you take flies from a farm, you can find this virus in them and they're fine. That's right? exactly right. Is that how it was originally discovered? Exactly. It was, uh, the, this uh, Drosophila C virus was isolated in France mm -hmm. because, you know, fruit flies, uh, they fly around uh, fruit and in particular grapes. <laughs> a lot of them in France. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Yeah, and so in France, they, and as you know, um, a lot of the interesting microbiology came from, um, you know, the industry of wine in yes. France. For example, Pasteur, you know, was working in uh, in yeast and in, uh, you know, and uh, yep. other. But yeah, so uh, so this, but the, the interesting thing is that Drosophila C virus doesn't cause disease in 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 in, in flies. But if you come with another. A, very close related to Drosophila C virus. Mm -hmm. um, it's called cricket paralysis virus. It's, it's lethal. It's highly... In Drosophila. In Drosophila. So there is something about these difference, differences in these two viruses, mm -hmm. like we see in viruses that, uh, you know, in, in, infect humans. Um, when, when this virus is, the cricket paralysis is a virus from cricket. And so, you know, probably is this sonotic uh, uh, jump from one insect to the other that makes that the virus is not, uh, adapted, um, to an, an equilibrium with the host. So just like people, when you have a zoonosis, when you have Ebola jumping from a bat to a human, it's lethal. But other viruses are better adapted that That's have been in the population a long time. Exactly, and Ebola itself in the bat is is because a, a, a benign right. infection is a persistent infection. So Drosophila C and cricket paralysis are both picornas. Yeah, that's interesting, <laughs> <laughs> and it comes from our, you know, as you, you know, you work in polio and in picornas, and we also. It's a, we call it a picorna, um, picorna-like virus. Okay. So it has. It's a positive-stranded RNA virus. And it, the organization of the genome is similar to uh, polio. And it has an iris, an internal ribosomal entry site, and the 5' UTR. 
but uh, the polyprotein is a split and okay. two open reading frames. And there's another iris in between, right? There's another iris in between, and um, the first um, the first open reading frame encode for um, non-structural proteins, and the structural proteins are encoded by the second and uh, swapped iris. around from so, the human and the animal picornas. That's right. The other thing is uh, similar to uh, human picornas is that there is uh, a covalent link peptide in the 5' UTR, mm -hmm. a BPG, right. um, that is presumably involved in replication, um, <clears throat> um, and, you know, have a poly A, and uh, they look very much uh, they're about 8 kb or 9 kb uh, in, in length. Um, and so in, in that regard, they're, they're, they're non-envelope. Right. So did you consciously pick these viruses because they were picorna-like and you we're used to working with coronaviruses. No, really. We uh, certainly that facilitate our, you know, um, work because we understand more or less uh, these viruses. It would be a DNA virus or a negative strand that would be a little bit more difficult. But really, the reason what we picked them because is just because these viruses were um, naturally in, in infecting naturally the Drosophila, okay. and it was a good model to try to further understand. So, if I understand right, cricket paralysis virus was originally isolated in crickets, right? Yes. It's also found in Drosophila in the wild. No, 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 not, not that I know. Maybe there's okay. some infections, but because it's a lethal infection, you might not be able to pick up, a, a, you right. know, flies okay. that infect. So the crickets where CPV was isolated, were they dead? They were paralyzed. Paralyzed, yeah, right? Yeah, they yeah. were paralyzed. So there was some. That's why they some, picked it up. That's, yeah. right. that's right. And is it found in other insects or just crickets? In a while. No, uh, actually, CRPV can infect many different uh, uh, insects. And it paralyzes uh, yeah, them, right? And it paralyzes or kills them, you know. We don't still don't know why it kills Drosophila. It, 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 we have the sense that it may be neurotropic, but um, it's not so clear. One of the problems we have with this, um, um, you know, uh, disistrony virus are called, this uh, picornavirus like, disistrony because two cistrons. The disistrony virus uh, is, is that this family has been very um, difficult to create infectious cDNAs to clone the the genome in a plasmid. And and they need to get me to do it. I think that you, you, you <laughs> can start a new career right now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, that's that's what I did a long time ago. Exactly. No. I'm, an, I'm an old man now. I can't do it anymore. No, oh, I'm sure <laughs> you can. But 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 the, but the thing is, we don't understand why it's, it's not infectious. If you extract the RNA from the virus particle, that's infectious. It's infectious. Will it replicate in a human cell? No. You put the RNA in a human cell. Does no, that, it do doesn't. We know, do we know why it doesn't replicate? We don't know. That's an interesting, interesting problem, problem. Right? Yeah. So the viruses won't infect either. And so you have made complete cloned... Uh, complete clone and, you know, m m map the very last nucleotide in the 5' UTR and the 3' prime, and we sequence uh, the consensus, uh, clone several virus cDNAs. And, and it's not only our lab. I mean, there's m several labs that are trying to do this and and it's been it's been difficult. So the cl the classification there is an order called Picornaviralis, and within that is the Picornaviridae, and then Dicistroviridae is a separate family with uh -huh. these Picorna-like viruses. That's what I'm lo I'm looking at Viral Zone. I don't know if you ever saw this uh, website. It's a Swiss website where they have a lot of nice information. Yeah, yeah. And so here you see Picornaviralis, Dicistroviridae, and then Picornas. Yes. So uh, it's a separate family, or at least, I don't know if this is an official ICTV classification or not, but uh, hmm. that's what's here. Interesting. There are many other viruses of insects out there. We yes. have talked about DNA viruses, iridoviruses, for example, but there are lots of RNA viruses as well. Yes. Different kinds. Are there yeah. enveloped uh, RNA viruses? Yeah, I mean, um, the um, the other classic virus that uh, in, uh, infect, uh, um, there's many, I mean, there's many families, but one other uh, classic virus is, uh, you know, this flockhouse uh, virus, virus okay. uh, also non-envelope. Um, we have adapted, well, the, the important thing, maybe I should say this, you know, one of the things that we're really interested in is 
Of course, Drosophila and these viruses are uh, interesting model systems to study. But when you think about it, um, we're going to learn many, many things mechanistically and basic about, you know, the interaction. And we'll right. talk more about it. But can this instruct something that is important in, the, in a more global sense, maybe for human health? Mm -hmm. And we know that there's a lot of viruses that are transmitted by insects, you know, by ticks, by mosquitoes and, and whatnot. And so understanding, you know, what happened and how Drosophila deals with these viruses, we can understand something about the biology of these vectors that transmit uh, human diseases like dengue virus and West Nile and, and alpha viruses, uh, chikungunya. And so one other system we use in, in this, in this uh, uh, project is alpha viruses like a Simbis virus. And the advantage of using Simbis viruses is that you can manipulate their genome. So for example, we have Simbis viruses that have GFP on it. And we can follow the progression of the virus right. through the through the fly by looking at the GFP expression. So Synbis is normally vectored by a mosquito, right? That's exactly right. And it infects various mammal species. Yes. Not people, though, right? Well, there's some some yeah. um, as well. Simliki is more uh, they infect people, but I think those are you know a broad spectrum. You know, they can okay. infect. But and Synbis has been a great lab. St virus has been a model system, right, for studying these, this particular kind of virus as well. So these Synbis viruses will infect Drosophila yeah, as well. Yeah, we adapted it to work in Drosophila just to in increase the fitness and in, in replication in Drosophila, but they can infect Drosophila. Okay. So if you pass them in this Drosophila cells, the, the virus became, there's some few changes in envelope proteins and it became very good adapt, uh, very well adapted. All right, so we have three viruses. We have the cricket paralysis, which will kill Drosophila, yeah. right? We have Drosophila C virus, which you infect and they're fine, they fly away. That's right, yeah, sort of. <laughs> and they, they live their entire life or they clear the infection? No, um, that's a good question. I don't think we understand it. We've done an experiment in which we've been, um, we infect Drosophila and try to model, you know, transmission from generation after generation right, of, right. Uh, of DCB. And this is an ongoing experiment. But in that case, we assume that the virus uh, has been persistently infecting the, the, the fly, at least until the fly, um, you know, hatch eggs and, mm -hmm. you know, have progeny, because the progeny is infected. Okay. So they could be, uh, you know, infect and persistent infected for, for a long time. And in the wild, I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, whether there's persistent infection. All right, then we have sim, then we have Synbis, which does what to the Drosophila? The Synbis is a, is a benign infection. Benign it doesn't also, kill them, okay. but, it, but, but you clearly see that it replicates very robustly in okay. a number of different sites. And, you know. So the other component of this, uh, well, there are two other components here. One is antiviral immunity in Drosophila. So flies have immunity. Yes, they have immunity. They make, do they make antibodies in T cells? Uh, no, it's a very different <laughs> immunity that we um, we used to to talk. I and mean, when when you when you think about T cells and antibody, is the type of immunity that you find in in, in mammalian systems. Mm -hmm. You um, you could argue that this is a protein based immune system. Okay. And this is a nucleic acid-based immune system. In flies. In flies. Flies have, um, they don't have proteins like antibodies or they don't have um, T cells, mm -hmm. but they do produce, um, like they have a very effective system to uh, uh, clear infection and it's based on RNA interference, okay. RNAi. So they need this to protect them against pathogens, I guess. So, and insects are ancient in terms of um, the evolutionary scale, right? So this is a very old kind of immune system. Well, I, you know, I'm not sure, you know, it's, uh, you know, I mean, maybe there is some, I think the, the insects are, you know, uh, I, it, depending on how you put it, right? So it's not that the insects are more ancient from the evolutionary point of view than we are. Mm -hmm. 
you know, so mammalian systems and insects actually evolve in parallel. That after worms, they separate in two different branches of evolution, and 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 insects continue. I mean, in insects um, uh, continue evolving, and they are very sophisticated in the system. It's just that the problem with the insects they were limited in the size, presumably because the respiratory system limited the, the amount of. Uh, oxygen that they can actually deliver to each cell. Okay. So the insects right, are very right. small, but very sophisticated in the things that they can uh, they can do. Okay. So they have a, a a kind of immune system which you say is based on RNA interference, right? Yes. So what does that mean? Well, it turns out that um, when this um, um, evolution is a parallel evolution between you know the branch that will give uh, mammalian the vertebrates and mammalians in, um, you know, insects, the other branch, uh, the decision was taken, you know, evolutionary decision was taken, that you still need to defend yourself against pathogens, including viruses. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the insect branch, it will be done using nucleic acids. And the system uh, is actually, this nucleic acid uh, system is certainly much more ancient th that... Um, uh, this branch of the insect. Uh, so it's been, it's very highly conserved through evolution. It was discovered in worms and C. elegans, but plants has, has it. Mm -hmm. And those are, um, you know, the RNA interference system is being, is a, is a system that's being used through the evolution for gene expression regulation. And in plants, for example, they regulate m multiple physiological conditions. In, uh, in, in our cells, we have a lot of um, um, functions also regulated by RNAi, what we call microRNAs. Right. Those are endogenous small RNAs. But in, in plants and in insects, now we understand that they can uh, play an additional role. And the additional role is that it can take information, the system can take information from incoming uh, virus, and in, in viruses infecting, and taking the nucleic acid that is brought by the virus when the virus delivers the, their genome, and use that genetic information to create immunity. And the way it creates immunity is it takes the RNA and makes double-stranded RNA and then they chop up the dopamine RNA in small pieces. And so we call this, this small pieces, small interferon RNA or siRNAs. And how big are these? It, it, they are in the order of 20 to 25 uh, okay. nucleotide in length. It's the stuff we used to throw away years ago. Exactly. Everybody lost, uh, I mean, <laughs> exactly. Everybody missed every, uh, this, this incredibly important regulatory molecules because they, we thought it was degradation products. And so those SIRNAs then are uh, loaded into a larger complex of protein called RISC or RISC RNA induced silencing complex. And um, RISC will unwind this double strand this small RNA and keep one of the strands. And so now you have a complex of proteins with a small 22 or 23, uh, 21 nucleotide long uh, um, RNA. Single stranded, right? Single stranded now. Mm -hmm. And so because it's single stranded, it can go around and find a complementary RNA. And once it finds a complementary RNA, it will cleave it it will uh, uh, cleave the target RNA. The, this whole risk complex has an enzyme in it that will cleave. It, exactly. RNA. There's an enzyme in this complex called Argonaut or AGO2 in, in, in Drosophila that has an endonuclease activity. And it only works when the small RNA has base pair with the target RNA. And then it cleaves not the, the guide, the small RNAs, but the target RNA. Clip that RNA, leave this RNA uh, clipped, and it goes finding another target. So if it's a virus, in this case, it will cleave the viral RNA, and it will inactivate it. That's, That's exactly. the idea. That's exactly so right. I, the, this whole idea of finding it is really interesting, because the cytoplasm is a big place, right? So there's a lot of randomness involved here. It's amazing that it works. Yeah, it's amazing. It's very interesting, and it, it, this is a, you, you, you put your finger in a very interesting aspect, is um, really 
um, is it really finding this in a you know just floating around and or is it position this risk yeah. complex in a particular gate where the nucleic acid has to the viral nucleic acid has to go through mm -hmm. and when it goes through this risk is sitting there right. waiting and monitoring whether the the, the runner RNA of the viral RNA is going through right. and in my opinion but I, this is a speculation a good gate a good place to position this 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 complex is in the polysomes or in the ribosomes because mm -hmm. as you know all the viruses the major function of virus is produced viral proteins sure, to be able to sure, replicate yeah. and uh, there are there are um, e evidence that risk is associated with with ribosomes and polysomes okay so it may be that there is but but uh, you're absolutely right we don't understand it. It's a very interesting area. You know, how is that really um, the mechanism for finding the target RNA? Right. What is so that? the virus, in the case of a picorna, it's single-stranded. It comes in and it, during its replication, it, has, it makes double-stranded intermediates. And those are then uh, cut up by argonaut in the risk yeah. complex, right? Yes. And then they're made single-stranded. Well, they're cut first and then loaded into the risk. Right? What's yes. the sequence? Yeah, that's right. So it's. I don't want to make it very complicated, but I think there's a lot of uh, people that will be listening to this conversation that are sophisticated sure. enough. So let me just make it a little more. Sure. Uh, yeah. One aspect that I think is interesting. Um, the the um, the simple model is. The virus, the the um, the uh, piconavirus, uh, the, you know, DCV comes in as a single-stranded RNA. Right. It makes protein, and then when there's enough protein made, the the replication start. Right. You make a double-stranded RNA intermediate, which is used for you know more replication. And so the simple model is dicer. There's an enzyme that chop up and produce the small RNAs. It's called dicer. dicer. Okay. Uh, that dice the um, the double-stranded RNA. So dicer is floating around in the cell, or it's associated. Is it? Part it's associated of it? with the, 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 the. I think there's a risk complex. Uh, I think it also have dicer. Okay. So it's a it's a big complex. So the the idea is that that dicer goes and cleaves this long double strand RNA, and um, and and produces small RNAs. The small RNAs then go and load it into argonaut, argonaut unwind them, and so now you have argonaut uh, ego two with small RNA ready to cleave the target RNA. Okay. But I think there is an open question that we don't understand: is what is the substrate for dicer? Is it really the double standard RNA intermediate the the substrate for dicer? And the reason why I said that is twofold. First of all, we don't know how much of the double stranded RNA replicated RNA is accumulated during infection, particularly at early mm -hmm. stages of infection. Might not be very much, right? It might not yeah. be very much. And the second issue is, you know that most of these viruses replicate associated with membranes. Mm -hmm. And now there are beautiful pictures that show the replication complex of these viruses are um, in this uh, imagination of different membranes, ER membranes, mitochondrial membranes. And the question is, can risk and dicer get in there to target the double strand RNA of the virus sure, sure. or not? And my gut feeling is that we actually don't, we haven't defined yet um, the, um, the, what is the substrate for dicer. So There's an open question as well. It is interesting because you're right, early on there's not a lot of double-stranded RNA. Yet we know early on is when this starts to kick in, right? That's right. So also mam mammals don't have this as a viral defense system, or they don't utilize it as a viral defense. Is that correct? Yeah, so far the evidence has been um, um, negative. So, uh, you know, of course it's, it's difficult to prove that something does not exist. Um, the original motivation by many people was, okay, if this system is so, um, you know, evolutionary conserved, is, is conserved from fungal to worms to insects to mammalians, mm -hmm. RNAi, why is that you lose the possibility of use RNAi as an antiviral yeah, defense? Sure, sure. Um, and and so people have been looking for the activities uh, of different in different ways, um, whether 
viruses will be actually um, uh, you know, controlled by RNAi. My feeling is that people have not done the correct experiment yet, I mean, because it's been difficult. You know, you do an experiment in tissue culture, it might not reflect um, what happened in vivo and immunoprivileged organs. So maybe RNAi is important in certain organs or certain stages of development before, you know, the immune system is mature enough. And so I think there are some experiments that has to be complete, uh, you know, until we can really say that in mammalian is not playing a role. But we have all the components, right? We do. We have, um, we have uh, several Argonauts, we have Dicer. The organization of the of the system is a little difficult, uh, different, and and the the difficulty is because, as I mentioned earlier, this RNAi uh, system works also in gene expression regulation, and so it could be that um, what happened is that this is a major gene expression regulation which is conserved through evolution, and from time to time, evolution you know create a new function for the system. And that function may be mm -hmm. an antiviral. So this might be pump up in in plants and might be pump up in in, in, in insects, right. but it had right. not been evolved in, in in mammalians. So you can view this as, in insects as a kind of innate immune system, right? Yeah. Is that is that right? Or well, I, it, I've heard it described as such because it's always active, right? Yeah. This so is interesting. Of course, the in, innate versus adapted immunity come from a definition of mammalian systems. Mm, the innate being something that is encoded in the germline and is ready to combat um, viruses or, or bacteria, whereas the adapted is uh, something that is also um, encoded in the germline and the, in, in, but has to be modified to um, and adapt a specific uh, response to a particular pathogen. Antibodies and T cells are that kind of adaptive immunity, whereas inter many of the interferon responses, PKR, RNSL, they are already there, there's nothing too modified. This system, in my opinion, is closer to an adaptive immunity. Because even though you have Dyson and Argonaut already encoded in the germline, you have to modify it. Mm -hmm. And the modification is a post-translation modification. And the post-translation modification is the acquisition of a small RNA that binds to the complex and assemble an active complex, and that can be right. antiviral. If you don't have the sRNA, there's no, there's no antiviral function for that. Okay, so then is there any memory involved in this <laughs> SI system? Very interesting question. I, I think the memory, um, qu question is solely open at this point. We've done experiments and the mem we've been able to document that at least for, you know, one or two weeks you can vaccinate a drosophila. So let me explain the, the experiment. What we do is we inoculate Drosophila with double stranded RNA. You, you inoculate flies, right? Yes. Okay. Fly with double stranded RNA that correspond to the sequence of DCV, for example, Drosophila C virus. Okay. And then we go back uh, one day, two days, five days, ten days after, and challenge those animals with uh, in, a, in a lethal infectious doses of. CRPB or DCB or whatever. You put enough, you kill the, even with DCB, you, if you uh, inoculate uh, enough uh, DCB, the fly will die. And what you see is that um, immunity lasts for about 10 days and mm -hmm. then it starts to uh, um, yep. win down. So there is a little bit of memory. It's not the years of memory that we see in mammalian system, but Drosophila doesn't live that long either. So you might argue that, uh, you know, yeah. 10 days or th uh, two weeks it may be sufficient. But the question of memory is very interesting, and I'll tell you why I think it's very interesting. When you, when you think about the RNAi systems as, um, in the one hand, regulatory, mm -hmm. uh, microRNAs, and on the other hand, antivirals, the, um, it, for the antiviral, you want memory. You want to create this active complex that targets viruses and maintain it as long as you can. So you maintain immunity as long as you can. In the regulatory system, you want a very dynamic system. You want to assemble and disassemble these complexes sure. very quickly. Yep. So 
And we don't know the dynamics of assembly and disassembly and the half-life of the system yet. So I think that's, uh, you know, you're touching a very interesting problem, not only biologically as an interesting problem, but mechanistically mm -hmm. at the molecular level, how, you know, what is the difference between sure. the argonaut that works in antiviral with the argonaut that works in, in, in gene regulation? By the way, what is the lifespan of Drosophila? Do you know? I don't know, two or three weeks. Okay, so this could be a significant amount of memory then. No, maybe, sorry, I, I, take, I, I take this back, not two or three, three weeks, but I don't know, two, two months? Well, let's look it up. Yes. 26 days. Okay. It depends mm. on the environmental conditions, it says here, but the average lifespan of a lab fly is 26 days for a female, 33 days for a male. Okay. All right. And the other question I had was, if you inoculate with double-stranded RNA from... Dice, um, Drosophila C virus, and then you infect with cricket paralysis. Is there cross protection? No, there's no cross protection, and that's a very interesting. That that that's what again is the, the, the an evidence that this is an adaptive immunity. You can have a very strong immunity to uh, one virus, but if the if the uh, insect has not been infected with the other virus, will not be protected to okay. the virus. So the immunity is sequence-specific, sequence really? Sequence-specific. All right, so in this paper, you say this antiviral immunity, which we've talked about, it's this RNA-based immune system, requires systemic RNA interference spread. What does that mean? Yeah, so um, the, the hypothesis that we start this project with the, um, the idea, the hypothesis in mind, that to be an effective immune system and a sophisticated immune system, the immune system wants to be one step ahead of infection. So when the infection gets there, it can control infection. Right. That's exactly the way that our system works. So you create, um, you know, a, an interferon cascade that would basically does is um, create a certain antiviral state of cells that surround the place where the infection is initiated. Um, in our case, also, you create antibodies that spread through the organism, so you protect other organs and other areas of the mm -hmm. of the of the um, individual, uh, and so you you stay one step ahead. So the hypothesis we put forward was: okay, if an RNA-based system, a nucleic acid-based uh, immunity system, immunity immune system. Um, um, uh, has to be one step ahead, and this is a general design of any immune system. Um, something has to be spread from the initial site of, mm -hmm. of infection to the rest of the organism. And what we po postulate, since this is nucleic acid base, is that, you know, in the initial site of infection, you will produce double stranded RNAs. Uh, or siRNAs that it will spread systemically. Mm -hmm. When the virus is spread from there, uh, we'll get into a cell that already has either double-stranded RNA or siRNAs directed against that virus, and that will create a sort of in intracellular immunity that will um, pr protect against the infection. Okay. And so you, you sort of limit the number of cells that get infected. So you have a very nice way of assaying this in flies, right? to seeing if if RNA is generated in one part of the fly can protect another part. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, um, uh, and, uh, there's a couple of things that we, we've done uh, there. We, one of the things that we did is um, initially we we said, okay, is it a nucleic, is it nu the nucleic acid, the, the thing is being spread, the signal for this protection is the nucleic acid. So what we did is we inoculate double-stranded RNA, as we were uh, saying before, double-stranded RNA into the flies, and then challenge the flies with a lethal dosis of the virus. So when you inoculate, how do you put it in the fly? So we have needles, very, very small, needles. Very small needle, and you put it under the wing uh, in the thorax. And so you you put it in the what is called is a circulatory system of the fly. It's called the hemolympha. It's the blood of the fly. Mm -hmm. So you put it in there, and the double stranded RNA will spread through the through the fly uh, through the using the circulatory system. And when you challenge, you challenge either in the same same place or in the opposite uh, uh, side of the of the insect. 
And, and what we saw is we had a very clear, specific protection uh, against the virus. So that was in the first thing. Uh, the first conclusion was you can put naked RNA in the flies, and the flies somehow will create an, anti uh, an antiviral immunity. And it's sequence-specific, as we right. discussed. And this is presumably involving this, this RNAi machinery that we talked That's about. That's exactly right. And it's spreading throughout the fly to protect other parts right. of the fly. So if you use a, um, um, if you do the same experiment in a background of flies that don't have dicer, say, or don't have mm -hmm. RNA2, which you can buy, right? You can buy from the, <laughs> this collection. Uh, very, it's very cheap, also, you know, twenty dollars, and you get this uh, fly. And you can breed them yourself. Then, That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and 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 so um, if you use a dicer uh, or argonaut two knockouts and try to vaccinate this this uh, this nucleic acid vaccination or mm -hmm. RNA vaccination, um, the fly is not protected. Uh, what what it shows that really is it is an RNAi phenomenon. So it's, it's this Dalton RNA you put in the in the fly is protecting the flies through an RNAi protection. Now the very intriguing question was um, how is this double strand RNA getting to the cells right. to encounter the RNA machinery? Because, um, you know, we don't put any, um, uh, transfection reagents, uh, right. liposomes or <laughs> lipofectamine or anything. It naturally, uh, uptake this. Right. And so we discovered this, this, um, this, um, this postdoc of mine, um, Carla Sale, that now is, a, she has an independent position in, in Pasteur Institute. So she's the first author here on this yeah, paper. She's the first okay. author. And, and so Carla, uh, discovered that there, there is a, um, system which is an endocytic, a, a receptor mediated endocytosis process that can very specifically take double-stranded RNA um, in, in, in an active way right. and deliver this RNA into the RNAi um, machinery to create an RNAi um, uh, protection or effect. And, and so she mapped a number of the genes. She did a screen to map a number of the genes involved in this pathway. And um, and then we went back to the collection of mutants mm -hmm. and request some of the uh, mutants of those genes. And we have like 60 or maybe 30 different genes. We, we collect three mutants that were viable, right. but they were defective in this, um, in this uptake. So these are for uptake into cells. That's right. That's right. So this, the, the, um, what, what we know at this point is that it's very specific for double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA or DNA do not, um, they are not internalized. Okay. We, with, we, we have some evidence that it's an scavenger receptor, um, that binds the double-stranded RNA, but we don't know exactly which molecule, there's some redundancy there. And then we know that it's clathrin mediated, mediated endocytosis. We know that the Golgi is involved in the um, uptake. We don't really know yet where is the translocation of the RNA from the outside right. into the cytoplasm. So there's a lot of questions that we don't, um, we need to uh, continue investigating there. But, the point is that those mutants that um, were defective in this double-stranded RNA uptake, when you challenge with viruses, they were hypersensitive to the infection. Mm -hmm. So this this flies um, will be much more susceptible to an inoculation with a low dosis of DCV or Krieger paralysis um, than the wild type flies, which demonstrated that um, this uptake mechanism, RNAi uptake mechanisms, is very important for uh, the protection of, of, the, of the fly. So, e so even if you don't immunize flies, this, when you infect them, this uh, uptake pathway is important in generating some immunity to uh, lower the consequences of infection. Exactly right. right. Exactly That's what you right. find. The, the phenotype, uh, the susceptibility to infection, mm -hmm. is similar to the uh, susceptibility that you will see when you have a knockout of uh, any of the components of the core machine, RNAi machinery. So, if, you know, some of this, uh, the uptake is as important as, you know, Dicer 2 or Argonaut 2. 
Um, <laughs> and, and so the, 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 the flies are really susceptible. They die in three or four days as opposed to, you know, uh, you know 30 days. So then how does the, uh, the RNA spread from one part of the fly to the other? Do we understand that? That's a good question, and that's what we are currently working on. Um, there's a couple of things that we don't understand. First of all is we inoculate 100,000, we calculate this, you know, when we do this um, inoculation, artificial inoculation, we can inoculate very precise amount of those in the RNA right. and ask, you know, what is the minimum amount that still protects the fly? And we went down to 100,000 molecules of double stranded RNA that still protect completely the flies. But there's many more cells in the flies. And so the question is really, uh, is any amplification step? Right. Is any, 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 as, any way that the initial information can be amplified by an, a host machinery? Mm -hmm. part of this uh, immune system. In plants, there is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that amplifies uh, the, the um, you know, uh, double-stranded RNA. But in Drosophila, by homology, by, uh, by, by you know, just blasting uh, this RNA-dependent RNA polymerases with the Drosophila genome, you don't find anything. And in humans, there is nothing. So for a long time, people have argued that there is no RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in flies or in humans. But I will argue that we haven't um, explored all the possibilities. Maybe the homology is not there, but functionally, maybe a protein that can do this. So that's one aspect. And the other aspect that you ask is, how is this um, double-stranded RNA spread through the, through the animal? And I would argue that it cannot spread, you know, um, just simply as a naked double-stranded RNA. I think it might associate with proteins or even with cells that will transport this along the, the organism. Very much like uh, we have in our systems. Sure, if this is sure, a sophisticated yeah. system, it has to be an active process. So is. let me understand this. So when you inoculate the fly, say, under in the thorax with double-stranded RNA, that protects, that that activates the uh, siRNA locally, and then that inoculated double-stranded RNA continues to spread, or when you infect them, does that, is RNA generated by the infection contributing to the spread? Mm. It's interesting, you know, you, you are, you're asking a very interesting set of questions. We don't really understand the process of when we inoculate double-stranded RNA, does this double-stranded RNA spread through the whole organism, right. and that's what it does, the protection. You don't we know. don't know. It may okay. be the intermediate steps. Locally, there is some, you know, acquisition of proteins, so it's incorporated in certain cells, and then from there, there's a second step of spread. Okay. That maybe we have not been able to address this. Um, uh, the um, what was the other thing you, you implicate in, in the air that is very so when you infect uh, is right. the virus spreading and inducing right the so this is an, uh, something that we really actively uh, 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 pursuing right now because in every immune system that I know um, not only uh, one thing that happened during infection is you activate the immune system. You know, there's signal, yeah. signals yeah, yeah. that, you know, upregulate the uh, important molecules that are uh, doing the, the, um, the uh, protection. And so, the, really, the question that we're trying to address now is if, uh, is the infection upregulating um, any of the process, the uptake process or the, the, the uh, dicer or argonauts and, and so, what is the what is the regulation of those okay. the, the system? Well, I remembered what I forgot to, to say before. Did you know in bacteria there's a similar nucleic acid based immune system, which has memory. It's called CRISPR. Mm. Have you heard yes. of that? Yes, absolutely. So when bacteria are infected with a phage or a plasmid comes in, the bacteria chop up the nucleic acid. They put it in their genome. Yes. And then the idea is that later, if they get reinfected, then it uses the bacterium uses the sequence to degrade similar yeah, stuff, right? Exactly. Except this has memory, exactly. whereas the insect uh, mm -hmm. systems don't apparently, yeah. or maybe they do and we don't know about it. Maybe or, we don't. Uh, or no, it's not uh, that long, or yeah. maybe in the life of a fly, as we said, it is long. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, right? but the CRISPR has a lot of uh, you know analogies with this. It's very interesting. Uh, yes.
Okay, the other paper I wanted to ch chat about a little is also, it's from Nature Structure, Structural and Molecular Biology, and the first author is Arabinda Nayak, and it's cricket paralysis virus antagonizes Argonaut 2 to modulate antiviral defense in Drosophila. So Argonaut is, is one of the enzymes that we've talked about that unwinds the double-stranded RNA. It's the endonuclease, it's the effector. Uh, it's effect, the one that chops it. It chops up the okay. target so RNA. So what unwinds it again? It's, it's also that. It same. also does both? Yeah, okay, so it unwinds and chops it up. Yeah. So here you're saying that cricket paralysis virus um, does something to Argonaut, and that's maybe why cricket kills Drosophila? Yeah, so um, so it, we know that um, you know one of the argument people uh, are, are using always that a particular antiviral system mm -hmm. uh, is uh, important, uh, you know, physiologically important for you know uh, restricting this particular virus. Is when you find that the virus is fighting back. Right. <laughs> so there is a you know you, you, the the host creates something to restrict the virus, and the virus does something to restrict the restriction and modulate the restriction. And it's a you know it's a it's a continue battle. That's you right. You know arm arm uh, the red queen red queen uh, hypothesis. You know the arm race exactly. And so one of the arguments has been made to to say that. Really, RNAi is an important uh, antiviral mechanism in plants and in insects. Is that plant and insect viruses all encode suppressors of uh, the RNAi machinery? Mm -hmm. And what are these suppressors? So there are small proteins. In the case of DCB and cricket paralysis, they are about between 100 and 160 amino acids in length, mm -hmm. encoded in the N-terminus of the first cistron. It's very interesting when you compare the genomes of this, these viruses, the homology is pretty high, in the, even in the capsid regions, but in the non-structural regions, very high, except in the N-terminus of the polyprotein. And it's exactly there where these proteins are encoded. Mm -hmm. And so every different um, disistrony virus encode one of these proteins, but they have very different structure motifs and, mm. and very different functions. Is that because they have different hosts? Well, you understand. It seems to be a. It seems to be a maybe a, just a coevolution. You know, just this these things may evolve independently, and if they are effective, yeah. they are kept. Sure. So anyway, in, in, in the case of DCV and CRPV, when you compare the um, homology between this, this proteins, it's really very low. And so we, we have a look at those two suppressors, and in the DCV is a double-stranded RNA binding protein. So it's a protein that binds double-stranded RNA, mm -hmm. and what it does is um, in, at least in tissue, in, in vitro, in an in vitro system, if you put recombinant protein, um, and uh, uh, of the suppressor and double strand RNA, Dicer cannot access the, to this uh, double strand right. RNA and it cannot produce siRNAs. So the model there is that actually cover, you know, is a competitor inhibitor of the enzyme that produce siRNAs. But binding the substrate. That's right. So there is enough of this protein that it can bind all the double stranded RNAs that might be present? Probably not. And that's why I don't believe that the model is correct. Okay. <laughs> uh, a particular early uh, uh, infection. We think it's more complex. But again, because since we don't know what is the substrate for Dicer, yeah. we don't know how much of this double strand RNA is. And so we don't know how much of this suppressor we'll need to prevent Dicer from nope. producing its RNAs. So you don't know how it works, these small... Proteins no, yet. but but everybody assumed that, it, and this this, this uh, suppressors in plants all are double strand RNA binders, on most of them, and so the the model is that it must be interfering with the production of siRNAs. There are demonstrations that this is the case. So this is DCB, the Drosophila C virus suppressor. We call DCB one A because it's in the first strand and this the protein A of the first strand. When you look at the cricket paralysis 1A protein, it doesn't look nothing like a double strand RNA binder. Um, there's no homology. It doesn't bind a, a nucleic acids. And instead, what it does is goes and binds 
um, and form a complex, very tight complex, with Argonaut 2. And so Argonaut 2 is the effector, is the one, once you have the siRNA, is the enzyme that goes and cleaves the, the target uh, RNA. And now we know that it doesn't uh, prevent production of sRNA or assembly of this large uh, risk complex. Mm -hmm. But it was, does is prevent the ac enzymatic activity. You know, once you put the suppressor in the presence of this risk complex, risk cannot cleave the target RNA. So, very different mechanism. And it's intriguing for what we were saying, that uh, these viruses co-evolve or will find different molecular solutions to the same problem. The virus wants to modulate the RNAi yeah, pathway, sure. but it doesn't in different ways. And, and this is what is so beautiful, uh, you know, and just looking at the evolution teach you so much about the mechanism. And nothing makes sense without evolution. Absolutely. It's everything. <laughs> Darwin was right. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you've been able to show that these small proteins can bind Argonaut 2? Yes. And prevent it from cleaving the target RNA sequence. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. So, do you think um, there's more than one way that these viruses can antagonize, or they just have one antagonistic protein and that's it? Because, you know, with PKR, say, in, in mammalian viruses, there are multiple ways that the viruses interfere with the substrate, with the PKR itself, and all sorts of things. So Yeah. I mean, whether the same virus, let's say DCB, has multiple ways to control yeah. the antiviral response um, is not clear. I My gut feeling is that, um, that's, that this is the master regulator um, for, for this interaction. Um, what is interesting is that this one I proteins are multifunctional proteins. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly, um, I mean, we're pursuing that, but we think that they are doing more than just affecting RNAi response. Mm -hmm. okay. So they're very interesting proteins. And they are very interesting for um, the reason that um, what the virus wants is find a sweet spot of interaction with the host in which it can produce enough virus and progeny to ensure their, you know, survive, so it can survive over generations, but without killing the host too fast. The sure. virus is not <laughs> interested in cause disease. The virus is interested in replicating and survive. Right. And if you kill the host too quickly, mm -hmm. then it's, you know, and you are, infecting a host that there's not many hosts around, so the, the density of the population of the host is low, it's not a good strategy. Right, right. HIV is a master. Yeah. HIV is master. HIV doesn't cause you disease for many, many years, and the infected individual can spread the virus long time. And the virus doesn't even kill you, it's something else. That's right. right? That's exactly right. As far as the virus is concerned, you could keep on living, and it could be transmitted over and over. Exactly yeah. right. And so what is interesting in this, in this thing is if we assume for a minute that these small proteins control the immune system, um, you can argue that those will be critical proteins to control the interaction between these insect viruses with the immune system, the insect immune system. So is it possible that these um, um, suppressors indeed um, control the severity of the infection. If these proteins are very, very mm -hmm. efficient to, to suppress the immune, sure, immune response, sure. maybe more pathogenic. And that was precisely what we were able to demonstrate. So what essentially we did is we went back to, since we don't have infectious cDNAs for this insect virus, That's we right. went back to um, 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 an alpha virus, Simbis virus, mm -hmm. and we insert um, these proteins, either the cricket paralysis protein or the DCV protein, and then compare this alpha virus, this Simbis virus, with the suppressors, how well they do in um, tissue culture, mm -hmm. and then in the in the fly. And so, in in BHK cells and cells in human cells, where presumably RNA is not playing an important role because it's a it's right, a hamster right. cell, the viruses replicate just. 
um, the, as well as wild type. There's no fitness cost. It doesn't replicate better or worse. Mm -hmm. But if you put it in the, in the flies, it's you know very dramatic the difference between uh, Simbis wild type without suppressors. Which is the, benign. Right? It's benign. Mm -hmm. it, the fly doesn't doesn't seems to be um, affected over the entire period of time of infection. You can detect virus produced during fifteen days, but it's not doesn't kill the, the fly. Right. If you put the Dros Drosophila C virus, which is the virus that causes a benign infection in Drosophila, you put the suppressor of of of, of, Drosoph of DCB. Now, Simbis is a little bit more infectious or it replicates a little more than the wild type without suppressor but still it's very benign but if you insert the suppressor from the cricket paralysis uh, in simbis and infect the, the the fly now the fly will die in few days so clearly there's a, a th this these factors are virulence um, determinants mm -hmm. right so uh, they the, the results you got by putting these proteins in simbis mirror the pathogenicity of the yes. original viruses in flies. Right. And you would like to have done those experiments in those viruses, but you don't have infectious exactly. DNAs yet. Yeah, that's when you come in and... You yeah, try well, I could do a sabbatical and try and do it for you. I think that would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and we start all over again. <laughs> that's right. That would be great. But remember, all of this is an arms race, so the, the hosts are slowly changing. And then the virus will change again. And this will happen over many, many years, of course. But yes. it's not static ever. No. And I don't know if you know Harmit Malik up in yes, University of, of Washington. He, okay. he studies this these arms races, too, yeah. in, in uh, viruses that infect mammalian cells. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's fascinating. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. So I'm going to stop soon because I promised you one hour. And so we're there because mm. you have work to do. But I want to ask you one more thing. These, you, as everyone can see, these kinds of experiments tell us fundamental principles about virus-host interactions. So it's quite clear that you have to do them, and it's quite clear that they have to be supported. Is the question is, can you get NIH support to do this kind of work, or is it difficult? <laughs> this is another very good question. You've been asking very good questions here. <laughs> I have uh, good training. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, my grant, my R1 that support this work is up to a renewal now. And, and I'm, I'm concerned. I mean, we're both coming back from a study section. We've seen, you know, the, the, the pay lines and the, the you know, how I mean, anybody listening to this is probably also aware that, um, NIH's, uh, budget is, uh, you know, not supporting many, um, um, R, R1s and, uh, you know, um, uh, investigator-initiated uh, programs, and it is an important thing to keep in mind. This is why I think it's a good question. It is um, we really don't know where the important information that will create the next um, generation of um, things that will improve the human health mm -hmm. will come from. I mean, it, we've been de it's been demonstrated that model organisms, Drosophila. Uh, worms, C. elegans, yeast, they are over and over teaching us fundamental things that they can be easily apply, applied in, 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 in for humans. And so it's very important to maintain a, a, a level of, of funding that um, and people that are working in model organisms because this is where, in my opinion, the really mechanistic uh, information will come. And so that would be, it's critical that we maintain that. Um, if we only work in human systems, we're only going to be able to do one type of experiment. Sure. But not going to be able to, you know, have yeah, 200 flies to, to, to do these experiments. Well it's done. different. You're looking at a different point in evolution. These kind of systems gives you different snapshots of how things were at a different times, perhaps exactly right. simpler organisms or less complex. It's really important to yeah. fill all that in. And the other thing is, the other thing is, there are fundamental uh, aspect of how you design, for example, an immune system. You know, what are the fundamental exactly, designing yeah. principles? And so you compare this immune system and you learn. You, you ask very important question: memory, you know, specificity, mm -hmm. uh, system. Uh, systemic spread, you know, staying one step ahead of the infection, all those things, you know, it, how, you know, how are designed in different systems, you right. know. So that's, I think, it, all, the, 
the only way you can do it is if you go and, and you know study these models. And, and, I, and I want listeners to understand the value of studying insects, worms, plants, where the immediate relevance to humans may not be obvious, but it is there, and it's important. And you know, politicians have made fun of working on mm -hmm. worms, for example. But it's nothing to make fun of. This is incredible work, and this goes on in many of these model systems, and we need to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, sometimes it's easier um, to um, um, to go and fight uh, for you know an increase in budget when you say you know this work is going to you know cure Alzheimer. It's easier, sure. you know, because you don't need to educate anybody. Everybody um, you know understand that this is an important work. Right. But it's right. much more difficult to convince somebody um, that. Uh, you know, studying this basic question uh, will really yield something very important. And yeah, yeah. as we were discussing before, um, I think that you can track down any important advance in human health in, in the world, in this country, to an R01 funded by NIH. But I bet that the time that the R01 was being developed was not uh, in mind uh, that this will help somebody. That's right. You That's know? right. Um, so that's what we do on TWIV. We, we try and teach people about the kinds of research, not only that are important and directly related to human health, but research that may not be obviously related, like research on insects. So that's why it's important. And that's why I, I tell my colleagues, come on this show and talk about what you're doing, because you're educating people, you're letting them know what you do, you're publicizing your work, and they are paying for it, so they should know about it. Yeah, yeah, so that's yeah. this is this is really good to do this. We don't actually talk much about uh, insect systems, but we should. Yeah, Insects, yeah. plants, worms. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I really appreciate. I mean, I not only is this is fun to talk to you, you know, in this conversation, and, but also the impact of this discussion. You know, you never never know who is uh, listening there, and so I mean, yeah, no, so no, we thank have for a, the opportunities. I'm happy to do it. I'm, I'm thank you for joining us. I we have a lot of listeners, and it grows every week. So you're reaching more people today than you've probably reached in your whole career. <laughs> in all the classes and all the students and postdocs, you're reaching more today. And I think that's the key of a podcast. That's what you can do with it. Scary. So thank, it's not scary, but it's good, too. <laughs> anyway, Raul, thanks for talking with me. Thank I you. I appreciate thank it. Thank you for the invitation. You can find TWIV on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace at microbeworld dot org slash twiv or at twiv dot tv you can also listen to twiv with your smartphone your iphone or android device there's an app for that you can find that at microworld.org slash app as always send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv dot tv i'd like to thank raul andino for talking with me today raul is at the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>